All right, welcome back again today, ladies and gentlemen. And I bet that 99.9% .9 of you watching this right now do not know this and have not seen this. So you've probably noticed a lot of times people ask about my forecasts and you'll hear me, you know, sometimes, I, I, I don't know if brag is the right word, but I'll often say, I made this forecast years ago or months ago and it's been very, very accurate. Now, okay, let me put my hands up. Not every single one of them is completely accurate. Sometimes they might be wrong, but in the most cases, they tend to be quite accurate. Now, I'm not taking credit for that because I'm gonna show you now how I do a lot of this, but I wanna show you this one key thing before that um, that I think is gonna surprise you. So let's go to the shared screen and I'm gonna read this out. The year is 2020 and the world's food system is under increasing stress. Extreme weather and political conflict are undermining food production and creating shortages. Prices are skyrocketing. Social unrest is growing. Populations are at risk. How will the world respond? And you might say, okay, two years ago, 2020, what's the big deal with that statement? The big deal is that statement was written in 2015 when an exercise was conducted around a food shortage, a food crisis period that went from, are you ready for this, 2020 to 2030. No, I'm not joking at all. I'm gonna show you this document and this exercise. And this is why I said 99.9% .9 of you, I don't think are aware of this. So how do I make these forecasts? Well, I have access to a lot of these reports and databases, and I look over a lot of these exercises. How did I come up with this? As many of you know, I was in the military for 10 years, the British Army, and I did a lot of exercises. I mean, part of my job was, was this, it was exercises. So one reason that the military do exercises, or not even just the military, um, public services, the police, the fire service, ambulance service, a lot of different groups do exercises. Why do we do that? Well, it's part of um, a model, it's Dale Edgar's Cone of Learning more specifically, but the 90% tier, the echelon of it there, is experiential learning. How do we create the best results and uh, be prepared for most events? It is through doing these physical exercises. So whether that is physically doing something manually or whether it is in a room and using your brain to calculate things as a group, these are exercises. And this is why if we look at what's happening right now around the world and we see these exercises going on, it's like last year when I told you about the Russian troop build up on the border and the exercises going on, I had no idea Russia was going, into, you know, going to go into Ukraine, but I knew that there were exercises going on and there was something strange going on there on the border. In the same way, what am I warning you about at the moment is China going into Taiwan. Now, I have no idea when that's gonna happen, but why would they be doing such specific military exercises that mimic an invasion of Taiwan? These are the questions that you've got to ask. So you don't ever do exercises for no reason. So you'll remember I made a video uh, last year on event 201. Let me just show you this again on the shared screen here. So event 201 was a global pandemic exercise. Now, this video I made was actually shadow banned, unfortunately, but it was a very good video. And this event took place in October, October 18th, 2019. So this was a coronavirus outbreak pandemic exercise, which took place just two months before the actual COVID global pandemic. Who were the sponsors of it? John Hopkins, the WEF, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you can sort of guess straight away why this was banned so quickly, this video. Now, when I use the word shadow banned, a lot of people often ask, what does that mean when you say that, Neil? What is shadow banning? So it's predominantly a YouTube and some of the you know, Google platforms or, or similar kind of platforms like that, where let's say a video is doing very, very well and it's getting shared and huge engagement, but then all of a sudden you see that, that, that sort of spike going up like that and it just drops and it drops off a cliff or it just plateaus and doesn't go anywhere. What that means is that a video has been deliberately subdued 
so that more people can't watch it. And this is why I always say that with my channel and my videos, make sure you have that bell notification turned on to all. Because if you don't, then, you know, if a video does ever get shadow banned, you are not ever going to see it. Um, just, I think it was last week, a video I made was shadow banned. That was on crime, where I took all the crime statistics of the United States, some from the United Kingdom, and I just outlined why and did some correlations. Again, that video was shadow banned, which is why you probably didn't see that video. So let's go back to the shared screen a moment then. And I wanna show you this really, really important document here then. And this was the food chain reaction crisis simulation, which took place here on the 12th of November, 2015. So a long time before the current food crisis we're seeing um, actually took place. Now look at the headline here. The simulation ended with a global carbon tax. Hmm, interesting. Climate, hunger, civil unrest, and spiking food prices came together at the food chain reaction game. What are we seeing right now? All four of these events taking place. The game took the players from the year 2020 to 2030. As it was projected, the decade brought two major food crises with prices approaching 400% of the long-term average. Okay, so straight away now we know what sort of numbers we're going to see in food price inflation. It is going to be somewhere around 400%. How do we know this? Because we have some very, very intelligent people that were on this game, this uh, what we used to call war games, but we'll just call this a, a food crisis exercise. And this is what they actually forecast, and this is what the model showed, a 400% increase in food prices. What else did we see? governments toppling in Pakistan and, huh, what is this country here? Ukraine. Famine and refugee crisis in Bangladesh, Myanmar, where we have a lot of issues in Myanmar right now, Chad and Sudan. Let's scroll down the page a little here then. In the face of a steep price spike with looming global food shortages in, I mean, you can't make this up, 2022, the EU at one point suspended its environmental rules for agriculture, huh, <laughs> interesting again, what are we seeing at the moment, and introduced a tax on meat. Again, there are so many coincidences to what is happening right now, because if you can't tax meat, what do you do instead? You make sure that meat becomes a lot harder to obtain or more expensive, which is the polar opposite, but gives the same effect as a tax on meat. Both measures were reversed in 2025 as harvest went back to normal and tensions eased in the hypothetical <laughs> universe. Hypothetical, this word always makes me laugh when I'm reading these reports. So again, we can see 2025 is the year that they forecast. And again, I would take this as gospel here because if they forecast this seven years ago and it's been pinpoint accurate so far, well, it stands to reason that the 2025 year and the 400% increase as well would be accurate as well. The most eye-catching result, however, was a deal between the US, the EU, India, and China standing in for the top 20 greenhouse gas emitters to institute, here it is, a global carbon tax and cap CO2 emissions in 2030. We've learned that a carbon tax is possibly well, now we know is definite because it's already in place in the years ahead. Take the meat tax Europe wanted to impose and think through that. What meat are you going to tax? Does that mean poultry and beef or aquaculture as well? Where do you levy the tax? Where does the money go? What are the unintended consequences? Well, I think we're seeing those at the moment. The game was built over the course of months with maximal realism, look at the language again, in mind. The scenario was extrapolated from events that have actually occurred in the real world, such as the food crisis of 2008 to 2009, or the recent string of hottest years and months on record. So again, they've done what I often do and look at a historical perspective here in order to forecast what may happen in the future. However, 
I think this is just too small of a range at the 2008 to 2009 crisis. I would have taken a lot more previous crises uh, of a similar nature to get a more accurate forecast. But look, it seems to be very accurate so far anyway. The realism of the exercise exceeded expectations, said former US Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, who acted as a mentor to the players. It's much closer to the real world than you'd think. The people who play here are very committed and serious. So I think that probably answers one question as to where I get a lot of the forecasts from. I look at all of these exercises. I have a huge database of many of these different exercises. And that's how I'm able to see things like energy and food and social unrest and uh, uh, economy and finance and the like. This is one thing I would definitely recommend you start looking into a lot of these exercises. But today, what I'd really love to, to see from you is please drop me a comment below. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on a lot of these exercises, a lot of the people and the organizations who are involved. What do you think is going on? Do you think this is purely innocent and just a complete coincidence how everything is so accurately forecast? Or do you think there's something a little more nefarious going on with a lot of these organizations, these exercises, and the way they're able to see things far into the future? All right, thanks for watching today. Take care, God bless, I'll see you tomorrow.